mostly vacant uh, during the week. And uh, what's the financial gain that any of us could receive from it? But also how do we think about that, not just for money in the bank, but as ministry partners uh, with us uh, as, a, as a church? And then how do we also share ministry with our Episcopal, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, whatever down the street partners, uh, or with our other Lutherans that are just down the way uh, in a bit more fruitful uh, way. So that's what I'm hope we can do today. And some of you who are here um, are already doing those things. And so part of this too is not just hearing from the panelists, but for you to share your best practices and questions that uh, you may have. More and more we hear people talk about shrinking church, shrinking church, shrinking church, and that's uh, some of that might be true. The reality is most people who are wanting to come to church just really don't care about that type of stuff. Um, and most people don't really care about how many people are filling uh, the pews. They want to know that their faith is being filled. And so how do we make sure that we can continue to offer that uh, space of grace for people? in a time where it seems like there's never enough money, never enough staff, never enough this, never enough fill in the blank. I truly believe that if God calls us to it, then we'll find the ways in which God will equip us and, and provide with that. Some of that means just leaning on, not just the everlasting arms, if you will, but the arms of our neighbors and other folks who we're in ministry with. Some of it's also trying to think a little bit more outside of our own box that we have put ourselves in as church. So, um, I've been blessed to be part of congregations that um, there wasn't a day in the week hardly to where the building wasn't used. Uh, I've been blessed to be part of congregations that have been willing to think a little outside the box uh, and engage their neighbors. And that wasn't uh, always met with uh, commonality or lack of bumping of heads, uh, but it certainly helped produce some fruit uh, with that. And we have on this panel today some really gifted folks who are uh, in various ways doing this type of stuff in their own congregations and offering advice in the Synod. One of the things I hope to say before we end this conversation today is um, if you know of grants that are out there or money that is out there for uh, innovative creative ministry that doesn't get said, please make sure that it's said before we leave this call uh, because there, there are ways to do these types of things that are out there that are all over the place. Um, since we've been on Senate staff together, we've applied, we've applied for at least uh, 10 different grants for different types of ministries. We've not received all of them, but we have received some. So we're grateful uh, for what that looks like. Lastly, let me say this. As congregations in this Senate continue to change and grow, and as even some of those close, one of the things we're committed to doing is taking those funds and reinvesting them back into the ministry of our synod. And so what we hope to do in the future as ministries have to close, we have to then take that and reinvest it back into uh, the other ministries in our synod. We've already done that this year by giving out over $100,000 in COVID-19 grants, which some of you on this call were recipients of uh, both personally and in your own ministries. We hope to continue that financial help, but also the supportive help of these types of conversations. So um, this is a think tank opportunity for us to think and dream as a church, but also to hear from folks who are already actively engaging some of these different ways uh, we do this. And if something after this conversation inspires you to say, you know what, I never thought about this for the congregation I'm in, but I want to think more about it then I encourage you to contact me or Pastor Patty Axel or Miss Melissa Fuller Sims on our Synod staff here uh, to have those conversations even more after this. But thanks for not only taking time, but making time for this conversation today. And uh, I'm grateful for it. So that's enough from me, Patty, but thanks for everyone jumping on here. Okay, thank you. Um, we have four panelists today and we're going to introduce them to you and then let them speak. Um, um, one of our panelists is Pastor Amy Figley. Pastor Figley is the senior pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. She has served at St. John's for over 20 years and in that time has developed a wonderful intentional faith formation event called WOW, Win Our World, which hosts about 250 right young people in the summer um, from all over the country. And I can only imagine space usage being a big thing in that when you try to figure out how to put that many people safely in a space and let them do mission. So 
Thank you. We're delighted that Pastor Figla is with us today to share her expertise in this area. Pastor Matt Simkin serves as the lead pastor at Christ South in Charlotte, North Carolina. He served numerous congregations in the Southeastern Synod, most recently in Atlanta at Lutheran Church of the Redeemer and Lutheran Campus Ministry at Georgia Tech's Grace House. While at Grace House, he developed a program called Passion Collective, which is a gap year program for young adults discerning a call to ministry. And he also started House of the Rock at Redeemer, which was great fun to worship there with him. We're delighted Pastor Matt Simpkins was willing to share his experiences and knowledge and how to apply for grants for creative property usage for churches. Melissa? Where'd she go? We'll give her a minute. To, uh, she's You're, on mute. You're on mute, Melissa. You need to unmute. There you go. Can you hear me now? We can. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Bob Boyd. Bob serves as Redeemer's Director of Operations and Finance, and he joined the staff in 2018. Prior to um, joining Redeemer, he served as Executive Director of Habitat for Humanity in DeKalb County. Prior to that, he led the Humane Society in Athens as the executive director. He served in various leadership and program roles with the Boy Scouts of America in Miami and Columbus, Georgia, and also in Macon. In addition to his business management skills, Bob has unique gifts in empowering volunteers to accomplish the mission of the organization he leads. Bob is a graduate of LaGrange College in LaGrange, Georgia, and he's married to Elizabeth and they have four children. His favorite passage of scripture is Matthew chapter 25. And he would share with us information about making the most of your space uh, in your congregation. Welcome Bob. And next we have uh, Charles Bridgers who grew up at Ascension Lutheran in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, he went to school at Emory University where he received degrees in biology, history, and he has practiced law since he graduated cum laude from Georgia State College of Law in 1993. Charles practices in the managing, as a managing partner at a small firm in Atlanta that specializes in nonprofit governance, executive compensation and litigation, technical labor and employment matters in federal court. In that practice, he has served as counsel in over 400 cases under the Fair Labor Standards Act and participate in over 20 jury trials. He serves as the Senate's attorney for the Southeastern Senate, and he is currently chair of the Board of Trustees of Novus Way. He and his wife, Suzanne, and daughter, Caroline, attend Redeemer Lutheran Church. Please welcome Charles Bridgers. And Charles, if you will start us out Thank you, Pastor. Um, my uh, role here today is to kind of speak about some of the legal perspectives of leasing your property. And I'm going to try to hit things in a little bit broad strokes and then go on to trying to spot some issues. Uh, as you might imagine, this is a bigger topic than just a couple of minutes. But the idea what I'm trying to do is to give people a sense of what to at least look out for. And then they can kind of work on their way as they try to figure these things out. But basically, a lot of our uh, congregations do lease space. Some of those leases are very temporary. Some go on for longer periods of time. But I think best practices is always to have something in writing, even if it is a short writing. Um, it, you know, is a general statement. I think that any policy, any contract, it, it doesn't matter if it's just a page or two, if you know that page or two and you want to agree to that page or two, that's a whole lot better than dozens of pages of boilerplate that somebody pulled off the internet that no one has ever read until there becomes a problem. Uh, that's not the way you want to discover what your contract says. Uh, ELCA has 
uh, general counsel's office has some stuff online. I think their advice about the written lease is probably the best I've heard is that as a practical rule of thumb, the length ought to be proportional to the length of the time of the lease. If the lease is something you can get out in 10 to 15 days, you may just need a paragraph or two or a page or two. If the lease is something you're signing for the next 10 years, that document may need to be 80, 100 pages. Uh, it just really depends on the proportionality of what you are trying to do. Um, I would encourage congregations to think ahead as to how they want to, you know, what, what, what is their policy going to be? Who makes those decisions? What are the contact? Who gathers information? Um, you know, and then put together a policy in terms that this congregation uh, or organization is going to require. And so what you can do is just a real nuts and bolts practical matter that congregation might have a page or two of its terms and conditions. And then you've got a cover page that you go into your particular organization and you say, all right, this organization, this long for this, you staple your terms and conditions to it. And you've got a pretty good understanding or everybody's got a good understanding of what's going on. To some extent, legal documents like that are they're the legal version of premarital counseling. That's what I like to tell people is let's have a conversation about this. Let's make sure our expectations are the same. You know, you don't want to discover after you're married that the partner wants three children. and You aren't only thinking about one. Uh, it's just a good way of setting expectations and making sure you have an understanding uh, a mutual understanding, and then the relationship's going to be fine as you go forward. A couple of big topics about leasing your space, and we may hit this in a little bit more detail, but do consider insurance. Uh, all of our congregations ought to have insurance in some form or the other. Um, if you start leasing your property out, tell your insurance agent. It is not only the right thing to do, but it's best for you if something were ever to happen and you were able to tell your agent, well, of course I told you we rented out the social hall uh, on alternate Thursdays. Uh, if you end up paying a couple extra dollars on your premium, that is money well spent if there's gonna be a problem. But think about insurance. It, it's just mandatory and we'll let your agent know if you're doing anything like leasing the property. I do wanna hit some of the tax issues out there. Um, a lot of our congregations are, well, every church is considered a 501c3, even if it is not actually applied, but many of our organizations are 501c's. And as a general statement, bringing in rental income does not deprive you of your tax exempt status. So that's just, you know, clear, period, full stop. Uh, you can bring in uh, income for that. Now, in certain situations, if you bring in income to your nonprofit, you might be liable for uh, unrelated business income, which is its own topic. It basically is a way for a nonprofit to bring in money of a commercial nature. And if they bring in that money for commercial nature, they might be required to pay some income tax on just that but that can be set off against other purchases and things, excuse me, other uh, upkeep and requirements of uh, the property. Now, UBIT is it's, it, 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 you could just go on for hours and hours and hours. UBIT has exceptions and the exceptions have exceptions and the exceptions to the exceptions have qualifications. So if you are in that uh, mode, you should think about an accountant who knows what they, who knows this area it's just too complex otherwise. But as a very general statement, rental income is not subject to UBIT unless you are a debt financed organization. If you've got a lot of debt on your property and you bring in rental income, there may be some exposure to UBIT. But even if there is, you know, a lot of things can be set off. It's something to talk to your accountant about. I think what a lot of our congregations bump into, and there's actually been a number of cases out there, especially for our in-town congregations that rent out their parking lots. Uh, there's been several cases about this because beyond federal taxation, um, there is the issue of ad valorem property taxes, same property tax you pay on your house. If 
a piece of property or a portion, a portion of a piece of property starts bringing in income, the county may look at that and say, this piece of property is no longer like a church. It is no longer like a nonprofit. It is more like a for-profit uh, entity. And they may look at that and they may fight you about making you pay property taxes. And again, those, uh, one, of the one of the struggles, you know, I have as a lawyer is I'm only licensed in Georgia, but I know these issues are out there in all the other states. Uh, but ad valorem property tax is something to keep in mind. Um, as a general statement, you know, uh, and how do you, how do you, how do you deal with some of this stuff? Um, if you've got an attorney in your congregation, that person might be a good person to review the agreement, uh, just to make sure it makes sense for somebody who's looking at it outside, someone who hasn't had those conversations. But, you know, like everything else, law is specialized. You know, any attorney can probably give you a decent opinion on a page or two uh, lease agreement, but don't, and this is a good rule of thumb across the board, don't ask your lawyers in your congregation to comment on stuff they don't know about. Uh, it's like asking a podiatrist about brain surgery. It is just a different skill level. And again, the more complex things are, the more you ought to go to a specialist. And that specialist requires going outside to pay somebody. It's money well spent. Um, in my two and a half minutes left, let me um, give you some just issues. Um, the things that I try to look at in every lease agreement, I. Uh, I, I look at, and again, they can be greater or lesser numbers of pages or paragraphs, depending on your situation. But just spotting issues, you gotta be sure who your parties are, who's doing this, know something about that group. Be clear who's using the property, especially if that property is, if your property is gonna be used um, that, that somehow might overlap in time or space with some of our vulnerable populations. Okay, if this is a children's Sunday school room, think about leasing that out, even if the person's somewhere else, you don't know what gets left. You just gotta be careful about things like that. But, so be clear about who they are and what they do. Be clear about the finances. How much, for how long? What is your expectation of that? Can they renew this contract? If so, under what terms? Do they get access to your parking? If so, how many spaces? Who pays for utilities if it's a longer term thing? Who pays for janitorial? How might you um, work on disputes? Is that arbitration? Is that litigation? Is that mediation? If you're dealing with somebody on a long term basis, are there personal guarantees? Uh, an entity, you know, that, that may not work for, you know, that may not be necessary for something on an afternoon. But if you have a longer term lease, you need to know who's paying the money and if there's any personal guarantees out there. Always think about, and I'll end on this, when you have a lease agreement, always think about your exit strategy. That's your ability to get out of something that is going poorly. Now, everybody wants certainty and you can build in certainty some of these things. But you want, may want to have the ability to cancel a lease on a certain amount of notice. If again, if it's going poorly and you can't communicate, uh, exit strategy is sometimes the best uh, thing to look at, or, or is certainly a big issue as you look at it. So overall, you know, we want to be, we want to be, we want to bring a lot of people into the church. We want to, you know, be active in our community. But again, don't be afraid to say no. One of my partners here says some of the best deals he ever made were the ones he walked away from. So uh, never, you know, be concerned about that. And actually, Pastor Patty, you hear that? I set myself a 10 minute timer and I shall now turn my time back over to you. Thank you, sir. Next, we will hear from Pastor Amy Thigley. Thank you so much. I do not have my 10 minute timer set, um, but I would love to follow Charles's um, example. And if Patty, if you would give me a high sign at some point, um, so as not to, to go over. 
it is a gift to be here with you all today and to speak out of experience of being a church in what we call the heart of the mission district. Um, that is probably an important distinction to make because um, it provides a lot of opportunity for um, ministry and hearing great stories and sometimes encountering people in all of their messy beautifulness. Um, so uh, St. John's is located uh, across from Volunteer Ministries, downtown Knoxville, across from Volunteer Ministry Center, and then down the block from Knox Area Rescue Ministry and Salvation Army. And so um, the three main social ministries in Knoxville are uh, easily within walking distance and at least one is within shouting distance. So our location intentionally informs what we do. And I'm very thankful for that. Uh, because of our location and because St. John's has been in the community for over 125 years, we have some uh, invitations to be a part of discussing how God's kingdom can come to this earth <laughs> by being creative and tending well to folks who are struggling with lack of employment, um, drug and alcohol abuse, uh, houselessness, um, those kind of things. And one of the most important things that happened was in, we were invited to be the host location about 15 years ago for all of the um, homeless ministries in Knoxville to gather to talk about what each person or each group did in order to create a continuum of care. That was under the um, direction of then uh, Mayor Bill Haslam and the partnerships that came out of those people meeting every week at our fellowship hall was incredibly significant. Um, so I, I share all of that because our location informs our ministry. And the other thing that I would hold up is really important. Um, and it's not so much technical as it is um, related to relationship and the places that we choose to make our investments. Everything that we do, uh, the people that we in, uh, partner with, the, the ministries that we, uh, in which we collaborate, all of that is tied back to our congregation's mission and vision. And uh, if I have learned anything um, in the transition from an associate pastor to a senior pastor at the same congregation where I've been for nearly 25 years, um, everyone, um, they, you know, they know my best jokes and they've seen me on my best days and my worst days and um, finding a way to tie ministry decisions to mission and vision has been really, really central not just for me as a, as a pastoral leader, but for our, our entire congregation. And so I would encourage you um, to think about that and um, to make sure that partnerships um, line up with your vision and your ministry. If we have time, I'll tell you about a difficult conversation, multiple conversations about having to um, redirect a relationship because um, theologically our our ministries uh, did not sync up well um, over the long haul. So the first thing that I want to suggest um, is to make sure or to consider the idea of whatever you're doing um, in your church or beyond your church or your ministry that it's tied to your mission. Um, the other thing that came out of our time together 15 years ago when we helped establish a, the 10 year plan to end chronic homelessness was the gift of collaboration. I probably should have, um, I should have gone back to find the, the origin of this quote because I'm, I, I'm actually gonna mess it up but I'll give you the gist of it and I'll try and find it before we're, um, we're finished. The, the thought of is if you wanna go fast, do it yourself. If you want to go far, invite a lot of other people to go with you. And so um, I am a big, big, big fan of collaboration. And the more creative that collaboration can be, the better. So um, 
I, I just, I offer that um, in that there are things that our, some of our ministry partners um, are able to do that we don't have the, the people power for. We don't have the, the education, we don't have the experience, but um, as a congregation, we can bring a lot of willingness to, to sweat, um, to uh, take direction, to uh, offer space. And so collaboration, I think, is really a significant uh, portion of what we're doing at St. John's. Uh, specifically with WOW, um, WOW is not something that started um, one day and had 250 teenagers and adults coming through um, in, a, in a two month summer period. Um, this is now um, probably an eight, going on 18 years. And my friend Jennifer Roberts, who's on the call with us, uh, she probably has the most recent experience because she wants to, um, uh, my husband just gave me the, the quote. Can I see that again? If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. An African proverb reported by Martha Go Godert. So there we go. <laughs> Always good to have a helpmate with a quick thumb on the, the, the smartphone. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, Jennifer was most recently the, um, the program director for WOW this past summer. So she might be able to speak to some of that as well. Um, WOW started um, as a um, one day a week experience that invited teenagers to be involved in ministry in downtown Knoxville. This was their response to the fact that we were having a capital campaign program to raise a million dollars for ministry in our neighborhood. And they were like, Pastor Amy, we do not have money to give to this, con to this uh, campaign, but we sure don't mind getting sweaty and gross. And we probably have some really creative ideas. So um, I, I offer all of that as well um, to say that some wisdom has grown out of our experience and collaboration in that we, um, when we start, we start with a trial period. Um, and uh, I really appreciated what Charles said about, you know, if you can get out of the, the, the lease in, you know, a matter of, um, you know, days or weeks, a couple of pages will do, but the, the longer someone's going to be with you, the, the longer and more detailed um, that needs to be is, is very, um, very true. So a lot of times when we have com, um, community ministries who are using our facilities, we will start with um, a, a definite amount of time and then plan on getting together and growing that relationship intentionally over time. Uh, Something that has made a huge difference in our collaborative efforts is that because it's tied to the mission of the congregation, that members of the congregation find ways to be involved in the ministry. And um, most recently, um, we started uh, two collaborative ministries during the pandemic to do feeding um, at, at the church uh, outdoors. Um, on Mondays and Thursdays. And what is interesting is one of those groups uh, is a partnership with a metropolitan community church, which means uh, the siblings that we're gathering with, um, most of them are part of the LGBTQI plus community. So that's Monday nights. And on Thursday nights, Highways and Byways is there. And um, that is hands down the most conservative worship experience I have been in during my tenure at, uh, as a Lutheran. Um, and it's really interesting because you would think that um, the super, super conservative group on Thursday night would not have anything to do with folks on Monday night and vice versa. But what has happened is um, they are sharing food and they are sharing clothing and they are sharing um, supplies with one another and they're talking to each other and um, the the gift of the investment of our members in both of those ministries has been incredibly um, significant. The other piece that I would offer is the need for clear communication, whether it's spoken, but more importantly, when it is written, um, written as in a, a contract, written as in uh, emails that are going to live forever. 
um, that, that seems to be very important as well. Um, there, I think um, somewhere down the line, we might want to talk about how St. John's finds a way to make room for um, 250 people over an eight week period and um, the creativity <laughs> that that takes. So um, I will defer to um, Patty and look forward to specific questions um, later on. Thanks so much. Thank you, Pastor Amy. Um, Bob? Thank you. Good afternoon. It's really my sincere privilege to be with you today discussing best practices regarding your church facility and its potential revenue producing opportunities. What would you do if you received a phone call from your local car dealership? You know, the big car dealership on the corner and the GM said they wanted to park 100 cars a month in your car but only for five days. And they would provide security and pay you $1,000 a day or $60,000 a year. Or if you had a location scout that wanted to film a movie in your church, they're only gonna be there for two weeks and they'd pay you $25,000. It's pretty tempting. But as has already been said, it's really important to keep in mind that while the church is an entire the church is a potential revenue stream. It's also imperative that we remember the core mission of the church. And as you all heard earlier, I came from the nonprofit world. This is my first church job. And when I first started, and hopefully my last church job, by the way, when I started at Redeemer just over three years ago, Pastor Mark Larson, our senior pastor, reminded me, we're not in the business of serving more meals to the homeless or generating revenue from grants parking fees, or facility rental, all of which we've done. Our core business is building discipleship. Of course, as you all heard, one of my favorite passages, chapters, is Matthew 25. And as the bishop said, we have to use our talents wisely, but we also need to remember the funds we generate should help us achieve our mission, not just increase the size of our checkbook. So before you begin thinking about your church as a revenue stream, I would suggest you ask yourself a few questions. For a moment, think about your church as a facility. How many square feet do you have in the church, excluding the sanctuary? As a side note, it's not a good idea to rent the sanctuary except for approved weddings. How often do you have church-related meetings, classes, or services in a week? Do you have classrooms or meeting rooms you can make available to other community organizations or nonprofits? More on that in a minute. How many parking spaces do you have? As Charles said earlier, you have to account for staff, volunteers, preschool, if you have a preschool. And where are you located? Are you a potential attractive daytime or evening parking? We'll circle back on that as well. And finally, if you watch movies or go to the watch television or go to the movies, you know that Georgia has a very robust movie industry and churches can make excellent sites for filming. And then finally, does your church have a ministry which could be eligible for governmental, public, or private grant funding? Do you have a staff member or a church member with grant writing experience and a passion for helping your church fund itself through the admin portion of the grant or the facility usage portion of a specific grant? After you've asked and answered these questions, how do you let the community at large know that you're open to sharing your facility? Now, when I first started at Redeemer, we joined the Midtown Alliance. It's kind of like the local chamber of commerce, but it's just for the Midtown Atlanta area. Our church's membership, by the way, which we paid at the nonprofit rate, helps us market our church, our services, our events, our preschool, and the facility itself to the neighboring individuals who live there who are members of Midtown Alliance and the businesses. So we began our relationship with the Midtown Alliance by inviting them to tour our facility. We offered to be a host site for a meeting space. After all, we generally have comfortable meeting spaces, AV equipment and parking. And don't forget, we can also offer food service if requested for a fee, of course. And because of COVID, we're meeting via Zoom. However, in-person meetings will return and may be as a hybrid. So if your church invests in hybrid equipment, 
then this could make you an attractive site as a meeting location as well. I'd suggest in terms of meeting spaces, first conduct a facility usage audit. How many hours per week are your classrooms or meeting rooms used for church-related meetings? Remember, companies like WeWorks and Spaces exist by offering desk and tabletop space for rent along with Wi-Fi. Which rooms in your church could be used for company meetings? You might start by asking your members if they work for a company that's looking to have a conference outside their office. Daytime meetings when your church is not used is a great way to generate revenue and bring non-members into the church. As a result of our facility audit, we identified two rooms which we only used for one hour a week. Ultimately, we leased these seldom used spaces to Operation Homefront, a post 9-11 veterans organization, and Inspiritus, two organizations whose values align with us and as organizations, they're in line with our strategic mission. We've also hosted meetings and conferences for Midtown Alliance and several nonprofits. Heck, I think we've even had a synod meeting or two at, at uh, Redeemer using our equipment. Last year, we served as an election precinct. If your church serves as a precinct, you know you can make a few dollars, but it, again, it's also a great, great way to bring your neighbors into your church. And as a precinct, we were reimbursed for our increased cleaning, sanitizing, and our security costs every time there was an election and every time there was a runoff. But we did have to invoice the county for that. Now, in order to protect the church, especially as, as the other two speakers have already said, have a contract or an MOU. Even if the group is a Boy Scout or Girl Scout Packer Troop, an AA group, or other non-paying organization that might be using your facilities. You probably have an attorney in your church who can help with this. Remember, as was mentioned earlier, be named as an additional insured on their insurance policy. Be clear on arrival and departure times, and also be clear on setup and takedown if the room is changed for any way for the meeting. And be sure to include a clause that helps you protect your broken tables and chairs in the event that that might happen. For paying groups, you wanna be sure and build cleaning costs and AV usage into the agreement. Have the church council buy into the process of leasing or providing space and make sure the property team's on board. And if you have any kind of long-term agreement, and I would personally define long-term as 12 months, as Charles and, and Pastor Amy said, make sure you have a way out. Avoid automatic renewals, which can lock you into a specific rate. Your costs will probably increase next year. It's okay if the rent goes up, particularly if the partner is getting great service. And on the topic of parking, if you decide to use your parking lot as a revenue generating piece, it's probably better to have a third party manage your parking lot. You don't wanna ask an overworked staff member to also send out invoices to the 25 people who lease spaces every month and then chase them when they don't make their payments. But if you do have a parking contract, make sure you have blackout days and include an option to terminate the contract. Again, have a contract. Ask several of your attorneys to review that document. And finally, as I said, churches can make excellent sites for filming movies, television shows, or commercials. Please make sure you see the script before the filming and have someone on site when they are filming. Ask the production company for location references they've filmed in previously and make the telephone call to find out. Were they easy to work with or were they really difficult? A fee of $5,000 or $25,000 may be a significant addition to your budget, but it's not worth it if your church is put in a negative light. I would recommend forming a review committee to authorize and oversee any film project that you have at your church. And on the topic of grant income, they can be a great source of revenue for your church. We should never assume because we're a church, we're ineligible to receive a grant. Check the requirements. In my three years at Redeemer, we've received almost a quarter million dollars in grant income and all the grant funding aligned with one of our ministries. But you do have to keep in mind with grants, there's always a record keeping, compliance, and a reporting requirement, which somebody's gonna have to do. So finally, clear communication regarding your facility usage is 
really critical. You might make mistakes, but make sure the church council, property team, and the staff are aware of the usage. Offering unused or seldom used space is a great way to generate revenue, bring non-members into the church, and foster a sense of community with your church, with your church members. But again, remember our core business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. And now, certainly last but not least, Pastor Matt Simpkins. What's going on, everybody? Everybody doing all right? Anybody need a stretch break? Do some jumping jacks, something <laughs> like that? Um, it's funny, I was listening to, uh, to Bob, and, and it brought back one of my favorite memories of my life, actually, was uh, being in a film with Michael Douglas in Redeemer's Sanctuary. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that and let you guys go find it. It's, it's in the archives of the Michael Douglas uh, filmography. And uh, I think my favorite moment from that was when he, uh, he asked me, uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, I told him I was a pastor here. And he was just like, oh, that's great. Uh, uh, wait, you're, a, you're, the, you're the pastor here. And I was like, yeah, well, I'm one of like 18 on staff. And he said, uh, he said well, that's amazing. I thought you were an actor. <laughs> all right fam uh we've got we've got to do some crazy things uh, i was back in um back in, i'm gonna start, i'm gonna tell you about three things one i was in knoxville tennessee um with uh, amy and the crew there at a church out in farragut and uh we decided that we were going to start working on uh building a campus out in uh in in i guess it was what is it like the teleco village is that that's loudon i think it's a loudon address and uh, we thought, boy, it'd be amazing to do this. Well, we don't have enough money to do it. How in the world could we possibly plant a church out here and make some sense out of it? And so the very first entrance that I got into thinking like this was, uh, was really in the mission development side. And it was that we went and partnered with a guy named Larry Click. And Larry Click had these funeral homes all over Knoxville. He was well known. I don't know if he's still doing anything, but uh, an amazing guy. And, uh, and he partnered with us so that he could kind of put his flag down there. And we said we could rent his space at a really small amount. And he built us a half million dollar building uh, to be in. So first thing I want to remind you is that there are partnerships that you can have if you just try. There's all kinds of partnerships that you can have. People all the time are looking. And I guarantee you, unless you're a redeemer and you're in the middle of like, you know, film center Atlanta, you see, folks are not calling on you regularly, right? So just, just see what happens when you put yourself out there. Second thing was in Atlanta. In Atlanta, we got to do some really, really fun things. And one of the things that we got to do was this idea that we had all of these rooms in this house, and there were no people in it. Meanwhile, I was, uh, I was on staff. Patty was working with me then. She was on my, my mutual ministry committee. She knows all the, all the, all the deep, dark secrets of my brain. And we, we thought, man, we've got this empty house. We had these really incredible people uh, that were there to help us, you know, explode the ministry. One of them is, you know, Pastor Chris Smith, who's on the call. And we did these incredible things. And then, well, Chris went off to seminary and a couple of the other folks went off and did their thing. We had this empty house. And we said, how can we utilize the space that we have, knowing that we only have one person on staff and we got a lot of things to do. And so we started this passion collective, which was almost like an internship gap year, figure your life out kind of thing. And we had people that came in and lived in the house and helped run the ministry in exchange for some continued counseling and opportunities to grow and figure out what their passions were uh, so that they could then go out into the world. And I think that those couple of creative sort of things that happened in ministry that I got to be a part of, um, well, they really were the, the basis for what we're, what we're doing in Charlotte. So I came here uh, to help Christ Lutheran Church uh, start a campus down uh, kind of the South Charlotte area um, and uh, in a place where there, there were some great congregations, but again, not a lot of congregations that had sort of that newer, newer version or abilities around worship and programming. Uh, was still bringing that Lutheran uh, theology of grace, right? And so, so I was like, well, let's go down there and put something down there. But if we do that, we really need to be paying attention to what it is that we're doing. So we started meeting in a gym, and we had an amazing group of people that came, and, uh, and it, was, it was fantastic. But God was calling us to do something more. So we started thinking about this. I love math. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys like math, but I like math. You got 60 minutes in every day, 
24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's a total of 10,080 minutes, all right? So just take my word for it. You can look it up on your phone calculator if you want, but it's 10,080 minutes. We at our congregations spend 90, 95% of our finances on how many minutes on average do you think it is? Somebody come off mute and say that we have with our people each week. 60. 60. Let's go with 70. Let's make it nice. So you got coffee time right before and after our, uh, our worship time, right? So 70 minutes in 10,080 available minutes. I realize you got to eat and you got to sleep, and I, I totally get that, but I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, so just walk with me. What kind of percentage is that? It's very, very low, right? Well, it makes some assumptions, though. Because those are folks that say that they go to church, right? Every, uh, they go to church regularly. But the fact of the matter is we found that people actually were only going to church 1.5 out of 4.5 Sundays on average per year or per month. So what that meant was that they were actually going to church regularly. They say they go regularly. They're only coming one third of the time. So that dropped that 0.76% down to 0.24. 0.24, not 24%, not 2%, 0.24% of a person's time is spent at church. And we pour 95% of our resources into that 0.24% of a person's time. Now, that right there is enough reason for all of us to be thinking, bruh, <laughs> the mission field is massive, and the mission field is not where we're focusing our finances and our energy. So we said we didn't want to do that. We said, well, if we're going to build something uh, for our Christ South campus, we're going to do something very, very different because we want to meet people in that 99.76% of their time that's not at church. We're going to meet the church people. They're, they're going to come. People that are interested in feeling and looking for church, they're going to know that we're there. We're going to meet on Sundays. We're going to do church program stuff. It's going to be amazing. But that can't be the most important thing that we do. So, Patty, can I share something really quick, and I'll run through, and then I'll stop talking. Melissa, can you help him do that? <laughs> Just got to allow the screen to be shared. Yeah, let's see here. So we came up with a concept called the Old Dairy Farm. And the Old Dairy Farm is what we're going to be titling our land, our sort of ministry, our reach. Everything that we do is going to be based out of this um, Old Dairy Farm. And it's a hub-and-spoke model. Now, the model is designed around seeking corporate partners and folks that are outside of our congregation to be financial partners. So what we had to do was we had to figure out a way uh, to make it available for us to accept money from people that don't give money to religious organizations. Uh, and we were, I'll spare you all the details. It doesn't look like I can share my screen still, so I'll just move on. But we've got a way now that we can do this. And so we created an entity, an LLC that lives on the uh, on the land and gives us an opportunity then to partner you're, with folks. You're now co-host, so you can share. Whoa, man. I, I means I can kick people out of the meeting. <laughs> Good luck, Bishop. See you around. It's, uh, so it's really fantastic. So I'll stop there. I think it'd be more fun to answer your questions about it. But, but it's, the whole goal is to meet people on that other 99 uh, percent of people's time. So I, I'll stop there and I think it'd be more fun to do questions anyway. Okay. Thank you very much, Pastor Matt. Um, okay, so we have got questions. Uh, we've got one question that has been posted so far for Charles. Um, are background checks needed if people that you're leasing space to are on the property at the same time as minors? Um, I, I would actually say no, not particularly, be, un, un, uh, unless they are in direct contact with the minors. You know, if, if somebody's running something in our, you know, our fireside room, you know, off the side and the, 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 the Sunday school is, is properly supervised with people who have had background checks, which is an absolute. Uh, I, I don't think you need background checks in, in that situation where there's no overlap between the uh, uh, between the vulnerable community. You, Charles, just a point of reference there. You you uh, you have to check your insurance, uh, and you also have to check 
how much involvement children are going to have in passing with whoever those people are. Um, so Safe Gathering is our background check company we use for the Synod. And then Church Mutual has different things they uh, recommend. But if people, to your point, I mean, if people aren't doing that, that's correct. But uh, the background check is important if children are going to be present with adults uh, unsupervised. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. It's just, it just depends on the overlap between the two populations. Okay. Thank you. Folks, what questions do you have? You can put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask them in person. I got one. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's uh, for Matt. Uh, what resources did you use to navigate receiving funds from your financial partners? You said you didn't want to get into it, but I, that, I'm actually intrigued by that. <laughs> Um, so Chris, we, we put together, um, we put together uh, an LLC and a board and set up bylaws so that we could um, have an organization. Now that organization ultimately has to have um, some sort of memorandum of understanding with the congregation. So the congregation would know that say the old dairy farm is gonna make decisions on the land in any areas that they want in order to produce that revenue uh, save for uh, incurring debt, right? So that was the one thing for us is if we're going to take on debt and we have to go back to the church. But if we're not taking on debt, then we could we could do that. Additionally, it was a nonprofit. So the nonprofit would then um, have to disperse those funds at the end of the year. And it made for an easy place to do that uh, to, for it to go back to the church. So there was usage that was happening. There was opportunities for us to be able to speak and meet with people all the time. And then receive those funds um, that uh, the nonprofit couldn't couldn't keep. Awesome, thank you. And it just so it's it, it's just so folks are aware. And I talked to Patty about this, but if there are folks that beyond this call want to know more about about that, I'm happy to to share some more of those conversations. More questions? I think there's one in chat, uh, Patty. The one from Tom Thompson? Right. Tom, you wanna to speak to that? I can't tell whether it's a question or a statement. It's actually Carol Thompson. Oh, Carol, hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on Tom's computer. <clears throat> um, if I understood right, the grants that I saw as samples were related to hunger or food food banks or, or ministries. Are there any, and maybe this isn't the form for that, but are, are you aware of any grants that would apply for property improvement and namely, in our case, a columbarium, which we, we will have to sell funded by selling niches, mm -hmm. but it would be nice to have a loan or a grant um, until we, so we can go ahead and build it and then reimburse. <laughs> yeah. Patty, I can, I can speak to that. So oh, please do. Yeah. Carol, I put in the chat box there, the ELCA world hunger grants, there's domestic hunger grants and our daily bread grants. And so if you have a food ministry in your church, then that you can actively apply for that. But if you're associated with a food ministry, like second harvest or something like that, you can still apply for those hunger grants. That, so that's why I posted that. To your question, I would suggest you look at ELCA Federal Credit Union uh, because if you're applying for this on behalf of a church, you can apply for a small business loan or you can apply for a small line of credit through the credit union. Uh, and the interest rates are lower because you're applying for it as a church and not as a person. And so the credit union will be helpful to navigate that the other thing I would say is if you're going to do a columbarium, you may want to talk to our endowment uh, gift planner, Anna Lugo, uh, and I put her information in the chat as well, but she would be helpful in helping you develop an endowment, legacy giving, um, how to best handle that whole in, uh, columbarium piece. Thank you. Thank you. I did write down the federal or the credit union link, um, but uh, I also wrote down the you, you've got it in chat about the legacy giving. And who is that? 
if you just want to email it again, to Anna Lugo, she's on our Senate website as well under staff. Okay, thank yeah. you. Wonderful. <clears throat> okay, this is a question for Charles Bridgers. In general, if your congregation does have mortgage debt on its property and it and anticipates any kind of leasing space, do you recommend it consult with an attorney or accountant who specializes in the nonprofit area to be clear if and how the UBIT analysis would apply? I think generally accountants would have a better idea about that and would know how to document that. Um, that's a very specialized area of tax law. And, and, but I think accountants bump into it more often than lawyers. Can you tell those of us who don't know what a UBIT is? Unrelated business income taxation. Isn't that it, Bob? Okay, there you go. Bob Boyd has become <laughs> our expert in redeemer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Patty, there was a question uh, to me privately. Yeah, uh-huh. The sell of land. Um, and so maybe it's just good if we just do all this all together. Sure. How many of you have congregations to where you have acreage that you could potentially sell? And I'm looking at the faces here. There's at least three or four that I know of. We have a number of congregations in our synod right now uh, during this pandemic who have done the work of looking at unused acreage and either selling that uh, just straight off or some are looking at um, leasing the land. And then we have others who have gone in with home uh, developers who are building homes on that land. Um, and then the church gets a, a kickback from the development. There's a number of ways people are doing that. The question was, how does one even start that uh, process? Uh, Charles, you may want to speak to that. Um, but my quick uh, response to that is, don't do it by yourself. Uh, so just because one member of the church thinks that's just a grand old idea, uh, I would form um, a small exploratory committee uh, to look at getting uh, someone to do an appraisal of the acreage, get at least three or four options of what the land could be used for, do a cost benefit analysis of what it would look like to sell the acreage. What does that look like for your congregation? Are you locking yourself in to where you can never do anything more with that? Uh, all those different types. It's kind of what like Pastor Matt was saying about exploring the whole process before jumping right in. Uh, I mean, I think that's the same thing with the land use. But we have one congregation right now that has nine acres. They're in the process of selling possibly to a, um, a home development. And it's going to be for low-income housing. Um, that will create an immense amount of revenue for this congregation that then they can put back into the ministry they'd like to do. Um, but Charles, do you want to speak to that? Because that can sometimes get really fuzzy or Bob. If I could, Bishop, I just do want to encourage people also. Can we can't hear you, Bob. Lean, just lean in, Bob. Now, now you, you unmuted yourself, Bob. Just lean into your microphone. Wouldn't be a Zoom call if somebody wasn't talking while they were on mute. <laughs> so do keep in mind how the property is owned. Uh, and uh, Charles can, I know, answer the Bishop's question more uh, more in detail, but zoning can have a play and an important role in how the property could be used by a potential developer. Yes, selling your selling your property is, is a really complex uh, situation, and as Bishop says, it needs outside people. Uh, even the, the 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 person who who who's your home realtor in the congregation just doesn't know this and don't put that person in the situation of advising the church on how to do that. I uh, need to talk to brokers. You need to have outside people look at this because it's such a big deal. The, uh, let me just throw this in for a couple of seconds, which strikes me about the low income housing or a, a, anything where you, a church sells off property. There has been a, a number of really creative um, concepts and deals done around the country, generally in metro areas. A lot of them have been in like Metro New York, where a congregation might have a block that is worth, I don't know, technically a gazillion dollars um, of parking lot space or something like that that they've had for 50 years. 
but there are some people out there and, and, and I can actually put you in touch with them that I've heard presentations from on the ELCA side where congregations go in and they might do a ground lease, they um, uh, allow for commercial things, but this is a big but, but they reserve something appropriate to that congregation's ministry at this time, such that maybe, maybe they let a skyscraper go up, but the church keeps a worship space that's exposed to the uh, sidewalk. And it's just an amazing, so the church can continue its ministry while monetizing its property. And a lot of those things, if you do it right, can come back to the church in 100 years, in 99 year round lease or something like that. Uh, as, and that, that is just hyper complex, but as um, uh, the person making the presentation, you know, the developer is not going to be here in 100 years, but the church is. So let's think about 100 years out and uh, think about that. So anyway, that's especially for your people in the metro areas uh, with limited land, that's something to think about. And uh, those, pos those concepts are out there. Great. Thank you. Um, Linda Barnes had uh, made a comment, the Federal Home Loan Bank offers wonderful workshops and seminars for those considering affordable housing development. So if you're interested, look into that. And then Ann Bassett to um, Matt, tell us more about the old dairy farm, sir, please. Sure, the concept is utilize what you have for two things, for sustainable community and sustainable finances, right? So the idea is that Whatever it is that you do, you want to have fit into both of those areas. Sustainable meaning uh, community that returns for other things than just the worship. So if worship wasn't part of it, what could you do with your property that would do that? For some of you guys, it might be uh, putting in a, like a legitimate coffee shop or some sort of indoor outdoor space on the land that people could utilize for any number of things. And the sustainable financial piece would be looking for those folks that would be long-term leases um, or, or some of those corporate developers that you say, look, if you got 10 acres, um, could we take six of it and use a, make a corporate development contract with six acres of that land and all of a sudden do some really amazing stuff with it? I'll, um, I'll take 10 more seconds and show you this, um, show you this thing that we, uh, that we came up with. The old dairy farm was, um, uh, this concept, right, of, of, of doing that sort of sustainability to reach beyond further than we could engage people to, to have that sustainable financial model and have consistent touch points where we could then impart that culture that we create of hospitality and of grace and of, of community and depth uh, into, something, into something more. And so um, I'll spray the mission and vision and all that stuff, but the hub and spoke model for the old dairy farm was a coffee shop, restaurant, multi-purpose space, a wedding venue, um, and then utilizing the land that we had. So this was the, uh, this is the coffee shop, what it was supposed to look like. And, uh, uh, excuse me, the restaurant, and there's the coffee shop. I mean, I don't know if this stuff you guys can see really looking at it like this, the indoor outdoor space, kind of like making the wedding barn on the site. Uh, utilizing it for uh, for weddings, we could we figured that we could run uh, about five to six weddings a weekend, and it not interfere with any kind of church activities, uh, and then have an indoor outdoor wedding in the woods space. So so there's all these kind of things that you could do by just rethinking how you use your land. And so I'm I'm helping congregations right now to do that, um, and uh, and I'm happy to have more conversations if people want to say, all right, so this is what we got. How do we how do we then use this for those sustainable uh, both finances and community? So I'm happy to do that if that's something that anybody wanted to explore uh, more beyond this call. Thank you, Matt. Um, another question: Has anyone ever looked at grants for maintenance of historic property? Also, would it be useful to look out um, trying an outreach activities to the grant relating to the use of the property? Any of you answer to that or? <laughs> I mean, I guess if you have a historic building, right? Um, if you don't have a historic building, then it wouldn't. Deborah, is that? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think the question is, is um, 
you know, we we can always do capital campaigns, but we do have a historic building. Pastor Amy can speak to that <laughs> she, historically and and a lot of the things that have happened over the years. But as we continue to, to look at that and try to maintain the church, there are other things that um, I've been thinking about. <gasps> aren't there potentials for grants that would help us offset some of those capital campaigns so that we could focus use on outreach. And um, so I'm just wondering if anybody has any ideas of uh, grant possibilities. I was thinking about looking into like uh, Eli Lilly or those types of areas, but again, um, not really clear and just thought this was a great uh, group to reach out and ask those types of questions. Yeah, but if you haven't already checked with uh, the city, that'd be the first place I'd look. I also know that our churches that are old, and we have one as old as 300 years old in the Synod, uh, but the historical register is what causes most churches problems when they want to do any sort of renovating or updating. Uh, okay. St. John's Lutheran right now in Atlanta has that same issue. Um, you know, Ascension Savannah has those issues with renovating space just because of the historical register. But what I've found in some of those places is if you get to know um, your, uh, your city uh, council members and as well as talk to the city historical register, there will be really helpful with trying to figure out the money behind that because if it's on the register and the city wants to preserve it, sometimes the city will also help with the financial means of that. The other okay. thing I put in the chat box is Mission Investment Fund. They don't just help build new churches, they help renovate existing ones. Okay. Uh, so it might be worth talking to Jerry Johnson, who's our uh, content person there. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Deborah, um, Linda Barnes said some of the local arts commissions will support historic preservation activities. Okay, great. Thank you. You know, uh, Ascension Savannah, when they did their big renovation in the last five years or so, made a partnership with the Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, and, and, and I don't think they got I don't think it was for free, but what they got was, you know, astronomically underpriced because they had students come in and, and I remember my mother showing me the place and literally the student over there with a little brush brushing the pulpit, cleaning it, you know, it probably took that woman another, you know, three months to finish that. But anyway, the, some of the art students schools out there might have uh, a program like that. Yeah. At being at University of Tennessee, I know a lot of people over in the arts and architecture area. So you're right. You know, I, I never thought about that kind of collaboration, but that's a great thing because even at the university, they're looking at ways to collaborate with the community. So thank you for that thought. Thank you. I have a, another question. Um, for post pandemic sheltering of homeless people on bitterly cold nights, if you have sort of a temporary shelter kind of thing, how do you protect the people who come to your shelter and are there specific guidelines for gender, is gender issues, separation of people for sleeping purposes? What are the legal, that's probably a multifaceted question, but. <laughs> wow. Um... You know, differentiation, minors and adults, minors, all different kind of protections for that, obviously. Mm -hmm. Adults, I think a congregation would want, I don't know the answer whether or not there's legal, I don't think there's any legal requirements on that. It's just your reasonable, um, your responsibility to act reasonably in all situations. Uh, if you're going to have people in there, you'd need a security person in there. You'd need a staff person in there. You could not leave those you could not leave guests like that or two, as Bob suggests. Uh, again, you know, Bob and I were both at Redeemer Atlanta, so we have lots of conversations about that. Um, so yeah, it's just, I think you know, for adults, it's your duty to act reasonably. And, and Pastor, if I could take a, 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 a short detour on this, I think I want to amend something I said earlier sure. of the whole um, um, background checks for, um, for people in that situation. I'm not sure if I, this was the question, but I think it's an interesting concept. Let's hit a hypothetical that a church um, allows in a youth group to meet. The church allows in a, a certain ministry that you know is going to have minors. Um, 
I think in this day and age that the church may not want to micromanage the process by which our guest, our lessor, deals with their minors. But I think our church would want to say, do you have a reasonable policy? Do you actually pay attention to that? Um, and again, it, it gets weird because once you start taking on obligations, you can get to be liable. To, but I think, well, as ELCA general counsel always says, we'll take on liability for protecting children. If we get sued over something, it's going to be sued for protecting children and not otherwise. Um, but I think that if you bring somebody in, I think it's reasonable to say, do you have a policy um, uh, to protect the minors that come in? Because if something bad were to happen, the church would get invited to the litigation party. Uh, and and, and it, it's best to ask those questions ahead of time. So I think, I'm not sure if that was the original question, but I, I thought that was an important clarification. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we have a question for Pastor Amy. You mentioned a rough experience with collaboration. Can you speak to what you would do differently? I can, and let me preface this by saying I'm going to um, uh, lean into Luther's Eighth Commandment and uh, keep all of the the, the down and dirty uh, out of it, because believe you me, there was some down and dirty. It was my first week. Um, it was before I was even installed in my new position at St. John's, right before I was getting ready to go on vacation. Um, but anyway, uh, it, it actually happened that one of our, our longtime ministry partners, we became aware of some um, theological differences that um, that had, um, well, let's see how to put this. It, re it related to their understanding of ministry to the LGBTQI plus community. Um, and to be clear, this uh, partner in ministry does incredible important work in downtown Knoxville but um, there was an issue that you could come in regardless of your orientation but you couldn't work there regardless of your orientation and um, at some point that became uh, a significant topic of conversation which led to looking even more closely at the description of their theological convictions. And when we looked closely, um, it was not just that issue around which we had disagreement. It, there, were, there were multiple issues. Now it was the one that was the flashpoint and it's the one that everybody had an opinion about. But when we dug deeper, we uh, discovered that there were some significant issues. And um, we ultimately, uh, with the help of the church council and our social um, ministry outreach team made the decision that we needed to, to redefine that relationship. And um, so now St. John's is not um, actively involved in ministry down there, although there are members who are still um, involved personally. And um, I, I'm thankful that I still have some really, really um, significant relationships with some of the folks who, who serve down there. But that gave, actually gave rise to the two new ministries that I mentioned that serve on Monday night and Thursday night. And I mentioned that those two groups um, on paper look theologically um, in opposition, but in reality, in ministry and in relationship, um, the, we align beautifully with them. And so um, what that has caused me to do early on in this new expression of ministry at St. John's is to keep in mind that, you know, I, I need to be as a, as a pastoral leader and as members of the congregation, we, we got we to gotta walk the talk. And so, um, you know, there's, there's this issue that we dealt with with one of our ministry partners. Uh, but in all of our dealings, um, I think it's really important to make sure that there aren't hidden facets that don't line up with our theology. And so I, I, the, the short of the long would be um, be diligent. Um, it's important for us to be diligent in making sure that the partnerships are healthy and um, that we are all moving in the same direction and that we're not, we're not, um, moving in opposite directions. Um, 
there's been some fallout. Um, I've had some some folks at church who uh, celebrated the decision we made. We had some folks at church who were very disappointed in the decision that we made. Um, we've had local congregations who have called us and said, what is it that you found out and can you share with us? And um, that set them on their, their own journey of exploration as well. So I, I think the important piece is as, uh, you, as we move forward in um, collaborative ministry is seeking to avoid future um, misunderstandings because we're looking at things differently from a, a theological perspective. That would be my, my word of wisdom um, around that. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Pastor Amy. Um, one last comment from somebody on the call. Um, the First United in Nashville uses room in the inn for housing the homeless and said that that council would be um, a possible resource for if you have questions about that to check with somebody at First, for, uh, First United. So thank you. Any other questions where, before we close up here? This has been wonderful. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you for all the great questions. But we have time for at least one more question before we, we close up. Patty, may I make one observation that I forgot to mention? Yes, absolutely. Uh, if you're looking for a cool um, opportunity for evangelism, um, we have opened up our congregation or our church facility to weddings. And um, this is an incredible opportunity. I have experienced this as, a, as an incredible opportunity to walk with couples as they're preparing for ministry. Um, and I think that that makes the world a better place generally. But um, over the past, I don't know, eight to 10 years, we've had about six families join the church because they had their initial entrance into the church doors at a wedding. Um, and um, some of the couples that we've cut with that we've counseled, not because we had to, but because they were interested have um, joined and um, the, those, those couples are all, um, you know, young couples that, that society would say, oh, they don't have any, they don't have any interest in the church. So um, I would just, um, you know, weddings can be seen as a, a stream of revenue and it's, that's very legitimate. Uh, it goes to some of the things that we've talked about here, but it's also an incredible opportunity for evangelism. So I just wanted to put in that plug if you're looking for a cool way to do um, outreach ministry. Great, thank you. And I wanted to correct, I had said First United, it's actually First Lutheran in Nashville. So, okay. Well, thank you all so much. Melissa, you wanna have any comments? Yes. Um what I would like to share is that um, if there are other topics in this area or outside of the area that you would like for us to uh, provide uh, panelists for, please reach out to Patty or myself or the Bishop, and we'd be more than happy to look into that. So if there's uh, deeper conversations around grants or any of those other types of topics, please let us know, and uh, we'd be interested in taking a look at it. Thank you to each one of our panelists. We appreciate your time on a Sunday afternoon and your expertise. So we will close with prayer and then send you on your way to dinner. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Awesome, God, as we leave this place, we put our trust in you before we know you will never, because we know that you will never shame us. We hope continually in you and praise you more and more. May we tell of your righteousness as we leave this place. Be our guide in everything that we do and lead us to the rock that is higher than us. Help us to abide in your word and let it guide us in all that we do. We shall continue to look up to you because you know that you are our shepherd. We know that you are our shepherd and we shall not lack anything. In Jesus' name, we believe and pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much.